Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Tam Green. I'm an art curator originally from Venezuela. And today we're having this amazing panel called Everyone is a Curator Now. Um, and talking about the difference and similarities and the importance of curating in the NFT and crypto space. So we're all going to introduce each other and talk a little bit about the importance of, of curating in this new frontier. Um, so I'm a curator. I came from the traditional art world, working in collections, art galleries, art fairs. And I was always interested in trying to find new cultural models for artists to be able to create abundance for themselves and be able to monetize in order to create more amazing art that is not necessarily tied to commodities that are you know, being sold as one painting on the wall. Um, so in, throughout my career, I worked in the intersection between art and other industries. So working with the city of Miami, creating very large scale art exhibitions, 48,000 square feet, uh, hundreds of artists at the same time. And we tested out always like new business models uh, before the experience economy was a thing. Um, we sort of realized that um, Artists didn't really, like millennials didn't really collect art as much as previous generations, but they were willing to like pay for a ticket to come and experience the art. And there were a lot of brands who were willing to collaborate with artists and pay those artists to create immersive art installations. Um, we got a lot of support from like the city of Miami or the real estate property owners. So I was always interested in exploring those other models. Um, I'm also the head curator of Showfield, which is an art and retail concept uh, here in New York, in Miami and LA, and soon opening in Williamsburg. And um, when I first understood around 2017 what NFTs were, um, and I understood that it meant perpetual royalties for artists for perpetuity, I, um, it took me a couple of years to like drop everything I was doing and get fully into the space. And then I realized that I was trying to explain to all the artists, like very excited, like let's do an NFT collection, let's do an NFT show. But nobody really understood, you know, what NFTs are, what the blockchain is. So I found myself like repeating the same thing over and over for 15 hours a day on the phone um, to artists. So then I got into like the education space for the last two years where I've just been teaching courses at Harvard, at different universities and museums and galleries and nonprofit art spaces to as many artists as I can, um, teaching them what's like the right, authentic, legitimate way of using these technologies. Um, and now it's, it's a book so that any artist can like learn about these technologies and get it. And it talks about NFTs from like an artistic perspective um, and also from like a uh, collector's perspective. So that's why I think you know it's important to curate in the NFT space so that we create relevance and uh, timeliness to, to the NFT work and give it its right place in history. You wanna go next, Michelle? Oh, okay, hi, is this thing? Yeah, this thing's on. Hi, my name is Michelle Macaron and um, I'm old and um, <clears throat> I entered the, I cringe when I say this, traditional art world. I'm an art historian. I started working in the New York art world in 1990. So I've seen a lot of really interesting changes and growth. Um, and I have owned and operated a physical gallery that was based in New York and Los Angeles, um, established in 2001. And I would say that my specialty was installation, site-specific art, conceptual work, a lot of ephemeral work, digital art, performance. And about, I would say about five years ago, I noticed that people started selling more and more paintings and started selling, or what had become popular is that people would send out PDFs to sell artwork. And less and less people were experiencing artwork in person in galleries. And I was lamenting this idea that I work with so much, so many incredible artists and that their work wasn't being valued the same way as a painting. And I was sitting on a couch, exasperated, talking to someone. And I said, I wish there was some interesting, decentralized, internet-y, 
you know, I'm not a technical person, intranet way that somehow artwork, digital artworks, installation, ephemeral works, conceptual art could be authenticated in some sort of ledge, kind of decentralized ledger. And my friend said, that's called the blockchain. And, um, and once I found out about the blockchain and found out about NFTs, I became a real convert. So I've pivoted my traditional practice. Again, I hate that word traditional because it's almost like NFT is not traditional. NFT is a new medium. NFT is like a painting. NFTs are, to me are, I'm, I've kind of, I'm a big convert and I really believe in the medium. I believe in its perpetuity. I believe in its institutionalism. And we're here to talk about curation. And as I described, I've pivoted my physical space into starting a new um, platform called Evo Art, where we will be representing artists and making exhibitions, functioning more like a gallery, but also part of our platform empowers collectors as curators. We are allowing collectors to come onto the platform. Um, they can hook their wallets into, into the site and their artworks would be loaded onto the site and they can go and select and create their own galleries. And to me, it's very important because a lot of people have been introduced to a lot of art through marketplace platforms and not through galleries, not through museums, not through curated contexts. So that's what I'm trying to provide is more you know, gravitas to the space. But knowing at the same time, the whole point to what we're working toward is decentralization and the mere thought of curation is a sense of centralization. So I am constantly conflict, conflicted or conflicted um, because I definitely believe in blockchain and I believe in the democracy, I believe in the direct to consumer. And in a way, gallery seems like an antiquated notion. So I, I, I feel like I'm sitting here as a paradox, but we're trying to figure out how with that centralization, perhaps there's a way that we could create a real institu institutional um, situation for NFTs, which I think is clearly needed. So anyway, that's enough from me. I want to hand it to Frances, who's been working more on the museum and institutional side, which, and, and she also coined this term that I'm obsessed with, which is digital thingness, which I'd love for her to talk about. So take it away, Frances. Hi everyone, I'm Frances. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm very much from the museum background. Um, I recently attained my PhD at Manchester University in the UK, uh, where I explored the application of NFTs in audience engagement practices. Um, and I had the fantastic opportunity to work with National Museums of Liverpool, or NML, uh, which is a collection of eight institutions based in and around Liverpool, UK on this project. Um, but what it really is, it's about this idea of participation, and it's about this idea of collaboration and how do we work with the group of participants to make them feel like they have a sense of belonging or a connection to a museum. So we basically co-created an online exhibition together um, and we, where we basically explored the kind of personal relationship to objects. Um, and if you look up Crypto Connections, Liverpool Museums, you can see the exhibition there. It's a really simple concept. Um, you'll see just some objects from the collection that were chosen by the participants with their kind of personal story about it. Um, but where the NFT comes in is that we created tokens of each of the works and gave these out to the participants. So the NFT becomes not only a kind of digital memento or a personal edition, but a way for them to memorialize their pro that process that they went through with us, um, but also to show that they are part of that collection as well. Um, and it brings that idea of kind of social value. So in terms of the idea of curation, of course, it's building on the idea of shared curatorial authority, which is an idea in museums we talk about the whole time. There's so much theory about it. You know, we call it the part of the museum. Um, but what I like about with NFTs is that it's building on what is already happening in the space a lot. We see it with collector DAOs, for example, or just even just with you know, people buying NFTs and curating themselves. It brings in that idea of you can do it. it bring, it's a shared sense of you know, care and looking after for those works. Um, so what I'm kind of interested in this space is thinking about how those two ideas collide. How can museums be inspired by this space and what's happening? Likewise, what can the space learn from some of the theories that have been happening for about the last 20 years? Um, so yeah, that's me. I'll pass it over to Nadia. Hello everyone. Um, there is um, 
I'm Nadia Taiga. Uh, there is India Lukin mentioned uh, in the program, and my partner, he couldn't come. So I'll be pretending that I'm his female avatar here. So and I will speak about Snark. Um, so about myself, I have uh, also background in traditional art world as an art exhibition producer and um, producer of public art projects. Um, I joined Snark uh, almost like four years ago, and Snark has started its journey uh, very early 2017, when there, is, was, there was not even a such a word NFT. So we uh, were formed at the, uh, as an experimental studio that aimed to create and explore blockchain technology as a new medium for the traditional artists or conceptual artists and uh, experimenting with different mediums or different genre, like uh, we created the first fractional ownership um, artwork of the digital film um, of Yves Sussman, 89 Seconds at Amais. Probably some of you are familiar with that piece. It's, um, there are 300 collectors uh, uh, of, the, of that film that is a museum quality film. The other copies are in Whitney Museum and MoMA Museum and still exhibiting around the world in different museums uh, already like a, as a blockchain copy. Um, and it was uh, the fractional ownership uh, experiment was practically as the first experiment of as well when we, you, the, the collector could be as a curator in a way with its decentralized and centralized um, interactivity uh, that is implemented in the atoms or so fractional uh, part of the artwork. And then we did uh, a few other projects in, uh, with Sonic artworks, um, artificial, artificial intelligence, and experimented with um, um, performances and last year, we created the first uh, dynamic NFT project with Michael Jun and Daniel Krivaruchka. Uh, it's uh, the project that combines together three elements, uh, very deep concept, conceptual part uh, that was developed by Michael Ju, who was interested through his uh, uh, artistic career in communal identity and how the materials transform over time and um, as well as blockchain, um, blockchain technology and gaming. So that the artwork, the, we created 10,000 seeds of the crystals and when you buy a seed and it goes to your crypto wallet and it re reads its data and the first part of the crystal is developed according to its data, like how old is the crypto wallet, what kind of um, assets you have there, what kind of artworks you have there, and then in order to make it grow, you have to sell it to another crypto wallet. And then it's just, it can grow entirely, but we locked it after uh, two months, uh, seven generations. And uh, in the end, it represents the community identity piece. I'm like act actively promoting it on my T-shirt here <laughs> as well. <laughs> and uh, scanning, you can scan me after um, and see what it is. Um, and. Uh, like following the success of this project, uh, we created last, uh, we launched last week the OG.art platform that is uh, the fully dedicated to dynamic NFT platform, uh, dynamic NFT projects with very like generative artists and traditional artists. And as well as we offering the market solution, OG protocol, it's a B2B solution for gaming industries and uh, uh, metaverses and whatever. So what is interesting for us in this space, uh, I just would like to quote uh, the second title of um, Lewis Carroll uh, poem, uh, Hunting of the Snark. This is why we, we call it Snark. That is sound like the impossible voyage of an improbable crew to find an inconceivable creature. So I think that it could apply to everyone in this room if you are searching for something new and what we do and exploring the new possibilities of blockchain and how those two probably worlds, uh, worlds traditional and uh, crypto world could merge and benefit from each other. We believe that blockchain could advance art 
of um, art, art market and of course giving the um, collectors uh, kind of like the, uh, applying them this role to be, to be curators in a way because they decide, they could decide easily what to do and explore their taste to the market. Yes, I agree. I think, you know, when we say every, everyone is a curator now, it's actually the title of an article by Hans Ulrich Obrist, who he's saying that the word curator used to mean like someone who cares for art in a museum institutional collection. But right now the word curator has been so democratized and overused, almost like the word community or the uh, a lot of words in the space that we use very lightly. Um, like right now there's like curated playlists, curated cheese menus, curated wine lists. Um, but um, I personally don't necessarily think that curate, curation is centralization. I think in the traditional art world and traditional art market previous to NFTs, there is definitely an aspect of gatekeeping to like which artists are allowed to exhibit in this museum, in this gallery, which artists are allowed to be sold in this specific platforms. But right now, um, I think, you know, anyone, a collector who decides like which artworks to buy and how to showcase those artworks in platforms like yours, Michelle, like they have like, there's, there's, there's no gatekeeping in the terms of like decentralized there needs to be examples. Access. I mean, there are, I mean, they're DAOs, but I don't see where you can go and see these collections on view in a really tight, specific way. And a lot of platforms I've seen, it's really hard to index, to search, and I'm creating a very easy, very easy to use platform called Evo Art, and hopefully we'll be launching someday soon. Um, <laughs> we're still working, um, because there's a lot of glitches, there's a lot of issues about the way that NFTs have been indexed and the way that they've been collected and way they've been purchased off of a multiple of different plat platforms with no standardization, no protocol for st smart contracts, no interoperability. Um, and, you know, in the traditional art world, we have a way in which artworks are indexed. And in the NFT space, that hasn't happened yet because it was almost the economy and markets took off. But the conservatorship and the institutional way that art has for, you know, generations been indexed and categorized and cared for and curated by hasn't been adopted in the space. And it needs to if we're gonna grow. Because for me, an NFT is a painting. An NFT belongs in a museum. There needs to be museums for NFTs, but they also need to be curated. And there needs to be a little bit of gatekeeping just for now, just to start. <laughs> Yeah, because let's just not forget that the term curation derives from the term to care. And the reason why you've bought that JPEG is ultimately because you care for it in some way, whatever that kind of value might be, whether that's economic or aesthetics or whatever. So you need to think about yourself as the potential curator. How do you make that work come alive? And things like your platform are a good example of where, you know, anyone as a collector can come and explore that term, how do I care for my NFT? How do we make it part of like art history and not just, you know, part of the art market, but the fact that it's institutionalized and selected by a curator means it's going to be part of like our human patrimony. So who makes that decision that certain NFT artists or certain NFT collection and the community that has a say in that collection can go down in the books as like a movement that is important in our history? We we have we have a couple working cases um, from um, our ex in our experience. Uh, as I mentioned, this um, artwork of by Yves Sussman, 89 seconds, atomized when uh, the person buys one atom, and actually it gives him the possibility also to close or open an access to its atom for other uh, participants, other community. But also, what is important that they all could schedule a screening of the museum piece, uh, either public or pu private screening. And in this case, they become a curator of, uh, of the piece, and they bring a crowd around, and they show the museum piece in, either in a any other occasions that we trust them. And it's a, it was also an excitement part from the art, 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 artist's point of view, that actually community, she gave up her rights to decide how work should live or when she, it, it should die. And she gave that 
power to the community to decide how it's going to work, not even to the museum, right? And another case, um, we are working right now because of um, uh, OG Crystals, dynamic protocol, uh, dynamic uh, NFTs, and uh, the community, there is a community, DAO, uh, that consists like 20,000 people uh, and um, 3,600 uh, owners of the crystals. And we are building now the physical sculpture out of those crystals, and it's a like huge, massive project. The sculpture is supposed to be probably 10, 15 meters uh, long, big. And uh, we are going to exhibit it in one of the <coughs> uh, important museums in the States. But uh, because, because everyone, uh, every uh, collect collector is a part of a DAO, we bring that vote uh, where we show and we inform the, the, the DAO where it's going to be shown, how it's going to be shown. So we have to, it's a long, long run, and it's not just ended after the exhibition will be finished. Then the DAO who should make another decision. And one thing I would like to bring, um, uh, mention, that um, I witnessed many situations when the collectors started to buy very simple artworks, let's say, I don't know, museum, uh, um, Venetian vases, uh, pretty kitschy, uh, kind of like not artistic, more artisan, um, what we see also, not we consider from our back background as a, as a quality artwork or like high-end museum piece artwork. But then when people start to buy, they invest in that and they appetite has started to grow and develop and they start to educate themselves. So I think now we are on the stage when the education become a very important part of what we all do here. That people that already have some NFTs collection and they probably bought it for monetary purpose, for, for, for speculative aspect, but after then, I believe in a good part of the human nature that we all seek for the higher meaning in our life. We have one minute left, so maybe Michelle and Francis will say like one last line about curation. Like mine is that I think people don't realize so much that curators are like the bridge between the artist and the people. So it's not necessarily gatekeeping and more like presented to audiences and communities in a way that they can connect to the artist and his message and their work. I mean, I think curation is your expression, your interpretation, and I think it's important for collectors to share experience and share their vision. And I'm always curious what collectors own, and I think that certain collectors can um, use their example to influence other collectors to uh, collect and to encourage them to also show their work. Francis? I would say basically, yeah, your own ideas are great and the role of yourself being a curator is really interesting, but what's so uh, what I love about the space is the role of collaboration and the idea of collective ownership. So use today to go find those people and go be, you know, co-curators. I, th I think I said enough, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, but uh, you know, I'm very excited that everyone. I agree. I agree uh, with Francis and my colleagues. So I just would like to echo that it's like co-creation. Co-creation is a very exciting part, and I believe that we all together create some artworks that will remain in the art history. Great panel. Thank you all so much. Um, let's keep the energy going, um, and I'd like to welcome